this once quiet country with its unbroken snow surfaces, war has come. Long hours of exposure to snow and cold may affect the soldier's health. Therefore, the soldier must learn a few important rules. He must know how to take care of himself in cold climates, how to conserve his body heat and energy. He must know how to keep clean and how to use his equipment. He must know first aid, for there are some injuries that occur in snow that can't happen anywhere else. The Army issues special cold weather clothing and equipment to ensure the personal health of every soldier. But the best clothing is of little use if you don't know how to wear it. Feet freeze easily, so wear as many pairs of socks as necessary, but be sure they're not too tight. Many layers of clothing are worn. The inner clothing fills with warmth from your own body. The outer windproof clothing keeps it there. Remember, wear a sensible amount of clothing. If your boots fit well with two pairs of socks, don't cram in a third. Lace the boots loosely to allow free circulation of blood. Take extra clean socks and mittens with you. And here are some other things to remember. Your rifle is painted white so as to be ready when the white camouflage uniform is put on. To prevent sunburn, apply the sunburn preventive before going out on patrol. Don't forget to pack your white camouflage uniform. It will come in handy in unbroken snow country. And to prevent chapped lips later on, use the chapstick. The things you wear will depend on the weather and what you're going to do. Above all, don't put on too much. Otherwise, you'll sweat and later on get chilled. These men are going out on a patrol. You will be sent on similar missions. They know how to take care of themselves, and you should too. Watch carefully. There are many lessons to be learned. When you reach unbroken snow country, change to your white uniform for the best camouflage protection. It's fatiguing for one man to break trail continuously so step out of file and change leadership occasionally. To conserve your energy, take a short rest and ventilate your clothing before returning to the line. Perspiration vaporizes and may collect on the inside of your outer clothing in the form of frost. The man who takes shortcuts up steep slopes is likely to become overheated and fatigued. As a result of becoming tired, hot, and sweaty, you may develop stiff and painful muscles. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Don't allow yourself to become overheated or unduly fatigued. Upon reaching broken terrain, change back to your dark uniform and take advantage of natural camouflage. When you're called to a halt, relieve the weight of your pack by shifting it forward and leaning on your ski poles. If possible, sit on a stone or log and rest the pack behind you. But never sit directly on the snow, for the warmth of your body may melt it and wet your clothing. If you have the temptation to eat snow, select clean snow and warm it in your hands. Nibble it slowly and don't let it touch your lips. While resting, eat either a piece of candy or part of your ration for added energy. The weather won't always be soft and easy out in the snow country. Sometimes it's going to come down hard, dig into your face, make you wish you'd never heard of winter. You can protect your face by pulling the parka hood forward on the windward side or by shielding your face with your gloved hand. Don't let your fingers stay still when the cold is blowing at them. Move them in your mittens. And move your toes around as shown in this cutaway boot. Remember, there's no such thing as a lone wolf when you're in the snow country. You're responsible for yourself and the man next to you. Look often to see what the cold weather is doing to your pal's face and ears. He'll keep an eye on you, too. If your hands get cold, draw them through the parka sleeves and warm them by putting them under your armpits. Freezing cold metal, touching warm, moist skin, sticks. To prevent this, keep all metal from touching your mouth or bare hands. 
Exercise in order to keep warm. And every time you have the chance, check those socks and boots. Your feet perspire in boots and the perspiration may freeze. Before darkness sets in, start looking for a campsite. Always look for natural shelter. Once you select the site, pack the snow down until it's level. While this is being done, another man will be getting the tents out of the packs. The third man by this time will have collected a mat of boughs to keep the floors of the tents dry and warm. Pitch the tents with the entrances downwind so the snow won't blow inside. Garbage and latrine pits should be dug downwind from the campsite. Never disregard basic sanitary procedures. The built-in ground cloth will keep the snow from coming in the sides of the tent. Brush off the snow from all clothing and equipment that's put inside the tent. Hoarfrost is invisible perspiration which freezes. It will form in your clothing and sleeping bag in very cold weather. Remove it as soon as possible, as clothing must be kept dry at all times. Whenever you take your boots off, remove the insoles and check them to make sure they are dry. If they're damp, replace them with dry ones. Next, take off both pairs of socks. Change them if they are at all moist. Since your feet perspire, even in this cold climate, your socks are likely to get damp. Make sure you dry out all your footgear, because if you don't, your feet are likely to become frostbitten. If your ears get cold without the parka hood over them, use the ear muffs on your cap. Damp socks can be dried by body warmth. This method is slow, but sure. Slip them under your inner clothing, but not next to your skin. Leave them there a while and they'll be warm and dry. When weather and conditions permit, do your cooking outside the tent. Water is needed to prepare dehydrated foods and you'll get water by gathering snow upwind from the campsite and melting it. When melting snow, put only a small amount at a time in the bottom of the pot or pan and continually push the snow down with a spoon or clean stick. Your food, consisting of soups, fruits, vegetables, and meats, is dehydrated so that it won't freeze when you carry it around in the snow and cold. In the cold, hands and fingers grow rapidly numb and clumsy. An extra amount of care must be taken when handling sharp tools if an injury is to be avoided. If it does occur, a simple pressure bandage will control the bleeding nine times out of ten. Only in an emergency should a tourniquet be used. When the temperature is below freezing, a tourniquet should be applied when hemorrhage can be controlled no other way. Cold mess equipment chills food rapidly. Your meat cans and cups should be held over the flame to warm before any food is placed in them. As a rule, it's better to take two small helpings of hot food rather than take one large helping that will get cold before you're through. It's important when you're miles away from civilization to keep your gear clean. Sterilize by boiling water in your gear. If you have any leftovers, don't drop them just anywhere. Use the garbage pit. That's what it's meant for. When the canteen cup is clean, you can use it as a container in which to melt snow and purify it for drinking water. If the water boils for at least a minute, it will not be necessary to use individual water purifying tablets. Now for bed. The sleeping bag will be part of your standard equipment for snow country. Place your heavy outer clothing under the sleeping bag for added insulation and dry all small articles like socks, mittens or insoles by putting them inside the bag. Don't track snow inside. It may melt and wet your sleeping bag. Just like your clothing, don't let it get damp, heavy and cold. So brush all snow off before entering the tent. Breathe through the face opening. 
If you breathe into the bag, you get less oxygen into your lungs and may exhale as much as a pint of water vapor during the night. And a good substitute for a pillow is a rolled up parka. A sweater or muffler over the nose will not only keep the face warm, but will catch the moisture of the breath. And remember, always sleep head to foot. Bodily cleanliness must not be neglected in cold weather. Shave at least once a week, preferably during the late afternoon. If you can't get water for bathing, dry scrub under your arms and in your crotch daily. Sunburn preventive used after shaving helps replace the natural oils of the skin that you've shaved off. Before retiring, be sure you tie up the tent entrance to keep the snow from drifting in. But always leave the ventilators open, even in the coldest weather. Whenever you move around, turn the bag over with you. Keep your face in the opening. If you turn over inside the bag, you will re-breathe bad air. This makes you puff and you are likely to awaken bewildered and confused. In your struggle to find the opening, you may destroy your sleeping bag. Don't let this happen to you. Keep your face in the opening. After a night's rest, put on as many clothes as you can while still in your bag. Due to the limited amount of space, one man remains in the bag while the other gets dressed. Be sure you roll the sleeping bag up from foot to head. This forces the warm air out of the bag and eliminates the danger of moisture freezing inside. Eat a hot breakfast before starting out in the morning. One man does the cooking for four. Fill up on liquids before leaving, as water carried in a canteen may freeze. You carry water in your canteen only when the weather is near freezing and when you're going to drink it soon after the canteen has been filled. If you don't have time to let the water boil, use the water purification tablets. If you carry the canteen wrapped up in the sleeping bag, the water in it will remain liquid longer. On a sunny day, it's easy to remember your snow goggles. But when it's hazy or overcast, that's the time to be careful. Even though the sun is hidden, dangerous light rays may still be present. Some time may pass before you realize trouble. Then it's too late to prevent it. A gritty feeling in your eyes or blurred vision are among the first symptoms of snow blindness. The first thing to do is get to an emergency shelter. If someone goes snow blind, you may be the one who must take care of him. Cool, wet clothes or packs will give the casualty some relief. These can't be used if there's danger of freezing. Lukewarm tea bags have a soothing action. Use them if other medicine is not available. Snow blindness is inexcusable. Don't let it catch you off guard. Wear your goggles. If you break or lose your goggles, you can improvise slit goggles from paper, cloth, leather, or even wood. In this instance, a ration box is being used. Men are most susceptible to cold when they're tired and hungry. Little inconveniences, such as an uncomfortable shoe or a damp sock, may serve as an excuse to stop and rest. If the weather is stormy or the wind strong, keep moving at all costs. If you give in, you're likely to become a serious casualty. Chances are this man might have avoided becoming a casualty. But nevertheless, he is one, and it's up to you to know what to do about it. The first thing to do is examine him. Get him off the snow and prepare to evacuate him on an improvised sled or a toboggan. Do not bend any parts that seem stiff. And to treat shock, keep him covered. The next thing to do is to take him to some kind of a shelter. When a man is suffering from exposure to cold, or if part of him is frozen, it's your job to know how to take care of him. You must know what frostbite is and how to recognize it. Maybe the man's nose or ears, cheeks, hands or feet are partially frozen. If they look grayish, waxy, that's frostbite. Freezing is frostbite in a more advanced stage. The skin is tight and drawn. It looks like a polished piece of marble. 
The best available source of warmth outdoors is body heat. Its proper use is an excellent emergency means for thawing frozen parts. At first, it must be used with great care because the part must not be thawed too fast. If the man is conscious, give him hot drinks, but nothing with alcohol in it. Alcohol makes you sleepy and dopey in the cold. Be careful with heat when you're treating frostbitten or frozen parts. Wrap a sweater or whatever is available around anything hot. Instead of putting it on the injured part, place it on his abdomen. All persons injured in the cold suffer from serious shock, and it is essential that the condition be treated simultaneously. If the thawing process results in a burning, tingling pain, slow down thawing. Remove the blankets and the heat and let some cold, fresh air in on the frozen part. Remember, take it slow and easy. And whatever you do, never rub or massage a frost-bitten or frozen part. But to improve the general circulation, massage his normal extremities toward the heart. An injury occurring in snow country is less painful, but more likely to be associated with shock. The injury itself may not be fatal, but the man may die of shock. It is important that great care be given to the examination of the injured man to see just what is wrong. Dust the snow off his clothing before putting him into or on a sleeping bag. Use the skis for an improvised sled. And use the ski poles for a splint but don't tie them too tightly to his leg or it will stop the circulation of blood in that part. Keep his head and the upper part of his body lower than his legs. Wrap him in whatever extra clothes or blankets you might have. Keep him warm. As soon as you have relieved the injured man as much as possible, take him to the nearest aid station for treatment by medical personnel. Remember, your personal health in snow country depends on many things. Carry reserve equipment, clothes, and rations. Keep your clothing dry. Conserve your energy and your body heat. Shield yourself from the wind. Avoid snow blindness. Stay with your detail and know your first aid. Remember these things and you'll lick the snow and cold and you can use the snow country to help lick the enemy.